This is the Obstacle Overcomer Podcast, dedicated to helping you overcome the obstacles that have been holding you back. My name is Nikki, and I'm a mother, author, empowerment speaker, singer, narrative changer, and obstacle overcomer. Each week, I'll be bringing you both the spiritual and practical tools that will empower you to overcome the challenges that you've been facing. You have the power to change the narrative of your life. You don't have to accept things as is. And always remember, obstacles are not barriers. They are stepping stones. Welcome back, overcomers. Welcome back. Welcome back to another edition of the Obstacle Overcomer Podcast. It's your girl, your host, Nikki Johnson, the overcomer and your empowerment coach. Y'all, I'm so excited. We're going to be talking about the leader within, the warrior, the champion, the prize that is you, that is within all of us. There is no better person to talk to us about this than the man that I'm about to introduce you to. So I first encountered him on Clubhouse. This man spoke for maybe three minutes. It could have been five. I don't even know. It was short. It was under 10, but it impacted me and resonated with me from the top of my head all the way through. And so I had to have him on to speak to my family. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Pablo Murillo. Hopefully he's smiling because I did it right. Pablo was born in Nicaragua and grew up during the Sandinista revolution of the 1970s. He learned early in his childhood what power of the people really meant. Growing up during the Revolutionary War taught him many lessons of survival, resilience, and how to overcome the horrors that come with experiencing war. He came to the U.S. in the 1980s, and after learning English, he attended UCLA. There, he became one of five students who formed a student organization called the Conscious Students of Color, or the CSC, which organized the massive takeover in 1994, leading to a hunger strike, which protected tutoring services for students of color stopped the Chicano and African-American library closures and gave birth to the Chicano Studies Department. Pablo is now a public speaker and founder of the Genesis Leadership Trainings, a company that's assisting organizations and individuals to increase their leadership skills. He believes that leadership development is more about self-awareness, self-discovery, and skills that should be taught in our public schools for its lessons are life lessons. And I could not agree with that more. He believes that the quality of life we have reflects our leadership and increasing our leadership will have an impact on the quality of life. It's already powerful, y'all. Come on now. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Pablo to the Obstacle Overcomer podcast. Welcome. Hello, Nikki Johnson and Nikki Johnson's Nation. This is Pablo Murillo from Genesis Leadership Trainings. Mira, mira, mira. Thank you for having me. I'm so blessed and grateful to be here. Thank you. I love that. I'm writing that down. Nikki Johnson's Nation. Yeah. Yeah, because God said he would give me nations. Love it. So thank you so much for being here today. I'm so excited. We're going to just jump right in. The first question that I've been wanting to ask you since I first connected with you was, how was life growing up where you grew up before you witnessed all of the war? Do you have any joyful memories of childhood at all? Wow. Do Wow, okay. That's how we're going to start, Nikki? Okay. Let me see. You know what? Um, I do have great memories, and my memories are about playing. But that was already during the war. So actually, the earliest memories I have are already of the war itself and me finding the happiness between those moments. So I don't remember something before that. My early memories are about the war itself and me playing in the streets, because in Nicaragua we play in the streets a lot. And yeah, so my good memories are being with my family, being with my grandmother, or maybe going out, selling stuff, because I was that child that sold stuff on the buses. Mm -hmm. Coming back and being able to say to my grandma, look, I sold everything, look how much money I have, right? Those were happy moments for me. And then playing in the streets, but that was already during the wartime. So yeah, that's mm -hmm. my early memory of that. 
Wow. So since your 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 childhood memories are so full of time of war, what age were you that you can first recall having to witness those those tragedies? The first time I recall me realizing that there was something wrong, I remember I couldn't read. So I am assuming I was maybe, I don't know, four or five, I want to say. And I picked up the newspaper and on the front page, there was a picture of civilians like leaning against a wall with rags, red, red and black rags, because those were the colors of the Sandinista revolution. And they had guns. And that was the picture there. I knew what guns were. And I remember me thinking, hmm, I wonder why these guys are on this picture, right? That was the first time that I realized there was something going on, but I didn't quite know it was war yet. And the war began on the outskirts, because when a revolution begins, although the thought process of a revolution begins in a university a lot of the times, when the revolution actually begins, it doesn't begin in the capital, it begins away, right? In the mountains, and with the, organizing the peasants. Mm. So that's where it started, and we started hearing rumors of it through the radio and the news. And then as people start getting more organized and get stronger, it starts coming closer and closer to the capital where I live. And that's when, you know, it came to our neighborhood, basically. You know, what is so ironic about that? That's the same way it can work in reverse. It's the people, if they come together and unite, are the ones that create that the power and can create the change. And that's that is right. usually why those uh, certain things are planted in, in people's thoughts and minds, because if you can get the people to change the way that they think, you can either bring them into fear where they do nothing, or they become empowered and they bring change. I've seen that in several different situations. The people just don't realize it's in your unity and in your, your knowledge and the coming together of all of those that the power lies. It's true. And back in those days, we had an army that was very, uh, it was criminal. They used to be killers. They used to come into your neighborhood and kill your father, rape your mother, rape all the women. I mean, it was atrocious. They had a license to kill. You know that song, License to Kill? Yes. I've seen what a license to kill looks like. And that army was that way. And I remember me seeing news where people would go out and protest, you know, and they go out protest and then, you know, 10 people get shot, right, by the army. Then another day people go protest, 15 people get shot by the army. Then eventually, though, this is what started happening. People went marching, 10 people got shot, but then one person from, one, uh, one soldier got shot. Then it was 10 people and three soldiers, 10 people, 10 soldiers, and then it was on. People, you know, like Bob Marley says, you can fool people, but you can fool them forever. Mm. And people get tired eventually of everything. And I think some of that shift you're seeing even in the United States right now, it's a version of that. I've seen this movie before. I've seen mm. it. When people started marching for Black Lives Matters and things, like when things happen like that, I go back to what I've seen and I know where people are at. I know as if, I know where society is at. Let's put it that way. I've seen the movie before and I know what comes next after that. And the, the one thing that I had to help my mind rebuild was to trust, to trust the world. Because you see, you get up every day and you have certain expectations. You get up, you go to work, you know, the cops come by. We might not feel secure with them depending on your experience, but you expect the cops to protect you, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. But there comes one day when all these norms break down and now the cops are actually the ones robbing you because nobody has food. You imagine that, right? Like the cops literally come into your house to rob you from your food because they don't have food for their own families. Yeah. So when the society breaks down that way is when you lose trust on everything. And it's difficult as a child to have to rebuild that trust on society because you really have no trust in humanity itself. And it was very damaging mentally for me, but it's something that leadership development, I've been able to piece together again. So here's the question. You said something you said you learned to trust the world. At the same time, you were living in war. How does a child grasp the term of trusting what they see as well as learning to trust the world when the world was in chaos around you? Right. Well, as a child, I got to tell you, I didn't trust the world. And literally, when I was nine, I was nine years old, I cursed God. I remember me going outside to the backyard in my house and just looking at the sky and cursing God because I thought, 
you're nowhere. Where are you? You're nowhere, right? As a child, I remember thinking that. Mm -hmm. And it's been until today that I put a post on my Instagram and I shared that with you, where I put the, a picture of the Bible. It's been years and years and years coming for me to come back to realizing that it wasn't God's fault. Yeah. And when I look back at my experiences, I actually became so resilient, you know, that experience that he kept me alive through, because frankly, I should have died so many times. You, It's like, the fact that I'm understanding is bonus life to me. That's why I'm ready to live it all, because it's been bonus to me. And looking back, I say, what kept me alive all those times when I should have been so dead? Yes. And I think it was God, because there's no other explanation. And so now coming back to, to uh, that trust factor, when I was a child, I didn't trust the world, Nikki. I didn't because all I saw, and imagine you being just a kid and going outside and seeing people literally take each other's lives, whether they were correct or not, or if it was just like that, a life is still a life. And seeing that and thinking that that is the world, this is where I live. What happened was that it was such an extreme, brutal way to live and lens that I saw everything through. I decided that I wasn't going to be a victim to that brutality. Mm. And that meant for me as a child to be more brutal than that. Because if I was going to be a survivor, I had to be stronger than that. And yeah. so if I saw somebody take a life, I was ready to take two. You see mm. what I mean? As a child to process that. I mean, gosh, I don't, it, it's I don't kind of, know how to verbalize it right now. Even now, yes. Yeah, because I go back to those moments and it's, as a child, you just process that. And even now thinking about it, it's like, oh my God, I can't believe. And there's so many children right now going through that. So it's not like I'm a... An, uh, uh, an exaggerated example. There's children right now living that in so many countries, Africa, Latin America, you know, the Caribbean, you name it. Mm -hmm. Even here so in the happening. United States. Right, right. And so what happened was I, when I got out of there and I came to the USA because I saw the world through that lens and that brutal lens, even though I wasn't in war, I was at war inside of me. Yes. Because Napoleon Hill in his book, Think and Grow Rich, he says, you become what you think about. But one thing that I've learned in my life, and this is something that will resonate with our communities of color or even working class. You not only become what you think about, you become the lens that you see the world through. And that's yes. what I call the, the law of the lens. If you see the world through that brutality, guess what happens? You go out and there's nothing that you, it, it, good things can go in front of you but you won't notice it because all your focus on is on finding the brutality. So I gravitated towards fighting. I mean, just violence because that's what I was looking for because that's, mm -hmm. that, that's what I saw the world as. Yeah. And so um, becoming that and realizing that that was so damaging in my life. I Inside of me, I had a desire to contribute. Inside of me, I talked about unity because I had seen what unity looked like in the war with at least people fighting back the army. Mm -hmm. I preached unity, but yet at the same time, all I did was war. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I was like two different people living in my same body. And I had to choose which one I was going to become, frankly, and which one I was going to intentionally feed and which one I was going to intentionally discard. Yes. And I thank God that I decided to intentionally feed the leadership, the leader in me. And that has changed my entire life. Well, let me tell you how good that is, because all of us, at some point, when you have gone through tragedy, when you've gone through some, some people have gone through some heart-wrenching situations and circumstances, you have to get to a point where you ask yourself that same question and you make the same decision that you had to make. What am I going to intentionally feed? What am I going to starve? What am I going to hold on to and build and, and elevate in? And what am I going to let go of? I want to ask you this question. What age were you when you decided, I'm going to be a better man, I'm going to be a better person, and decided to let go of all the anger or the rage or the things that you had inside? It's been a process. It's been a series of experiences where I've been able to have a moment of clarity, if you will. Mm. And so it's been like an experience, and then I make a decision to change this particular part. Yes. And then I keep going and there's been another hit, like a real failure per se, 
and then I'm at the bottom of the barrel and then I go, oh gosh, I need to change this too. So it's been a process of doing those, but I would say I'm going to be 50 in six days. Okay, 50, you look amazing and happy early birthday. What has happened to me? <laughs> Half a century. Whoa. Half a century. Um, so let me see. But if I had to put around what age, I would say in my, I want to say maybe around 32, 33, 32, 33. I started really like starting paying attention and started really, really making sure that I started changing certain things in my life. Yes. So it was important to change your surroundings and change the places that you allow yourself to be. Definitely, because as, as I change my habits, this is what you'll find. If you change your habits and you start developing a certain identity, there are certain people that you can yield with anymore. It just, for example, when I decided to stop drinking, I realized that the people I was hanging around with, the only commonality we had was drinking. So once I stopped drinking and I came around them, there was really nothing else to connect me to them because right. alcohol was the only thing that kept us around each other. Right. And so things like that, I started just letting go because it didn't serve me anymore. And yeah. that's what success is about. You got to identify the habits that serve you and discard the habits that hinder you. Yeah. And as you do that, the people that come connected with those habits, the associations that come connected with those habits, start also living your life. Oh, I love that. I love it. So what this first of all what brought you to the united states like what was the decision made for you to come to the u.s how old were you and how life-changing was just coming here so my gra i never grew up with my mother or my dad my mom actually was a guerrilla fighter so she left you know and she left me with my grandmother and my grandmother and my two aunties raised me mm. so, and there were no men in the house the only two husbands that my aunties were married to, they were they were like a poor example of what a man should be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, really poor. Right. And they used to come home and get drunk and beat them. Mm -hmm. And so I would jump in with a broomstick and hit them and help my aunties fight them off. Right. And it's weird that you have experiences like that, right? And a man grows up to say, "Well, that's why I beat women now because I grew up watching women getting beat." But for me, it was the opposite. Mm. Seeing my aunties get beat made me say to myself as a child that I would never, ever hit a woman, no matter what. And uh, even during the days that I was like really in a bad space, I remember a girl hit me in the mouth in the, at a club because I was about to kick her boyfriend's butt. Mm -hmm. And she hit me and I look and then she just looked at me and I couldn't punch her. And I'm proud of that. Like even in my worst days, I just couldn't bring myself to hit a woman just because of those days. Yeah. But the point, going back to what you asked, my grandmother always said, my, my dad was here in the United States. He had remarried and had a family. And she said, she kept asking me, go ask your dad to take you to the USA. We're never going to be able to have a good life here, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's, the Revolutionary War ended on July 19, 1979, okay? July 19, which is next month. That day, I always, it's a very emotional day for me because uh, it's just huge. And so after July 1979, we began rebuilding the country, okay? After the long civil war, for the first time, we were at peace. Mm -hmm. And we started organizing committees in every street, like the neighborhood watch committees. Mm -hmm. Every street had a committee, Nikki, and we met weekly. And my auntie was involved in that committee. And we met weekly, we sent what we needed, and we sent that to the regional and then the regional would give us a response a week or two later. Mm -hmm. And so we were, I mean, we were, it was real power of the people. But from 1979 to 81, in 81, there was a president here by the name of Ronald Reagan. And he didn't like what we were doing. And mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that they didn't like was the fact that 60% of the land that we had in Nicaragua was owned by United States corporations. Mm -hmm. and they were producing products to sell here and we needed the land to feed our people. Yeah. So the government pay the corporation. They said, they said, look, you pay this much for the land. Here's your money, which was not the value of the land, but that's what they paid. And they didn't like it at all. So Reagan imposed economic sanctions on the country. When you hear that term, I want you to know that economic sanctions means let's starve every child, let's starve every woman, let's starve every man in that country. That's what that means. Mm -hmm. And so the hope of doing that is that the people will be so hungry that they'll turn on their own government. 
which is a really horrible thing to do, but that's what it was. So from 81 to 89, I lived under that situation. I had to run like sometimes five, 10 miles, literally to find rice. Cause I would run and then they would say, we have no rice, but I heard they have rice the next place. And I would keep running and keep running. And sometimes it was like literally like eight miles at least that I had to run to go cut, get rice. And so in 89, my grandmother said, um, but she kept telling me, ask your dad to take you. And I told her, I don't know him. I don't know his wife. I don't know her ki their kids. I don't want to be like Cinderella, like that movie, okay? <laughs> and yes. so, but one day I came home, I remember, I came back from selling newspapers and I used to sell newspapers in the buses until like 8.30 p.m. or so. And I came and um, she was crying, my grandma. And I knew why she was crying because it was a stressful life. Yeah. I gave her the money and I was rubbing her on, on her shoulder. Mm -hmm. and, then she, and, I, and then I said, it'll be okay, grandma. And she said, look, tell your dad to take you. If you go to the United States, you can grow up and make dollars and mm -hmm. send it to us so that we can be better. Yes. That moment, that became my why. So if you ever feel stuck or you feel doubtful about doing something, the reason why is because you're not clear why you must do that, okay? Because when you get a big why, the how, the where, and the when become easy. So when that became my why to get dollars to send them to my family, how and where and when didn't worry me anymore. So I wrote a letter to my dad, he agreed, and then he brought me here, and that's how I came here. And when I came, I mean, it's amazing. I don't know how to explain it, but you know how you go to Disneyland and you see the, it's a wonder world, whatever you call that? Yeah. That's how it feels. It feels like when you come from where I came from, I was so scared of the freeway. I had never seen five lanes of cars going in one direction without a traffic. Like, are you kidding me? I was thinking, I just came to the United States and I'm about to die. <laughs> That's how much of a culture shock he was. Not to mention the fact that all these words that you hear me saying were just noise to me back then. I, could, I was hearing people speak and they were like, that's the way it sounded. Right. And then all of a sudden they would go, puta. And I would be like, did they just say what I think they said, right? And then chaka right up, puta. And I was like, what is going on here? Well, you know what it was? They were saying, put that in the car, put that over there, put that over here. Right. <laughs> so um, it was a major culture shock and having to learn the language, just learning a whole new, different world. It was just... I just didn't know how to cope with it. And I think that that, that fear of war, mm -hmm. dealing with that extreme fear mm -hmm. has helped me so much throughout my life because I can only explain that fear you feel in a new world like that with people that are not really your family, like I felt. But that fear was nothing compared to the fear that I have been used to breaking. Yes. And that fear of learning English, that fear of becoming a public speaker, that fear of trying to start my business, that fear of going to college. None of those fears face me. I feel them just like anybody does. Yeah. Yeah. Feeling fear is human, but living in fear is just a bad habit that we can break. Mm -hmm. Feeling the fear is not the same as letting it overtake you. I love that. I also was listening to you. You were talking about having to go sometimes eight miles for just rice. And then you come here to the United States and there are food stands everywhere. There are restaurants everywhere. There are grocery stores in abundance. I can only imagine the, the shock and having to really just acclimate yourself to the new world, as you called it. However, just in the things that I read on your post, listening to you on Clubhouse, our interactions before this interview even started, it put a certain level of gratitude in you for what you have and that you don't take certain things for granted because you know what it's like on the other side. Can you speak on that for just a little bit and then we'll move forward? Definitely. I, you know, I, I, I still don't understand why people throw away the first, the first piece of the bread in the loaf of bread. <laughs> people <laughs> still do that, right? Sometimes they call it the little butt in, yes. Yeah. People throw that away. Yeah. I still eat that piece of bread. Just because it looks a little weird, we throw it away. That is bread. It's food. I don't, you know, yeah. I used to dislike and I still dislike somewhere when I see movies where people start having food fights. Yeah. I don't ever play with food. Like that doesn't even register in my mind, right? And so you're right. All that abundance that I saw here. Yeah. But it also, I tell you what, it also angered me. Mm -hmm. it, that, that rage I had even became more when I saw 
everything that was here because I realized why it was being taken from where I was. You see what I mean? Yes. I was like, this is why mm. they're so committed to destroying us down there because they want to keep just taking. And that's the truth. And when people speak about immigration, right? This is something that nobody will ever tell you. I'm gonna say it here, Nikki, in your in your in your uh, program to help people understand. People don't come here just because they want to leave their home. I didn't want to come here. The funniest thing is though that I had to leave my country because Ronald Reagan wouldn't leave us alone. If he would have left me alone, I think I would have become a general in the army. You know that? Mm. <laughs> I think I would just become a a soldier yeah. in, in in my own army. But he, he, he made it so badly that he pushed me to have to go out somewhere. And then you come here. And then when you get here, you're told, get the hell out of here. Go back to where you came from. Yeah. And you're like, wait a minute. Which one are you going to pick? Because yeah. I would like to be down there, to be honest, right? In, in yeah. my home where I was. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that is having that abundance mentality is important. So let me give you an example. Just for anybody, even if you were born here or if you're an immigrant. I want you to imagine that you win a lottery, right? You win the lottery, you become a multimillionaire. Imagine that, right? Three million dollars. And then you buy a nice mansion, which is obviously something that we should invest if we can, if we make money. You buy the mansion and then you tell your family, we're moving, let's go, we made it, we have arrived. I don't know. Yeah, yeah all right. And then you drive to the mansion and you have, you know, maybe you have four kids, your wife and yourself. And you move into the mansion, Nikki, and you tell everybody, okay, come over here. This is the kitchen right here. Let's move into the kitchen. Mm. I want you to put your bed right here, everybody. You know, the refrigerator there, and we're gonna take a shower right here next to the sink. Just, you know, using some water, some cloth. And then that your wife says, or your husband says, but wait a minute, we have 10 rooms in the house. It has two floors. But you say, I don't want anybody to go there. We're going to just stay here in the kitchen. And from here, just leave, use the back door and go to work, come back. I don't want anybody to dirty the rest of the mansion. Please don't touch anything. Mm -hmm. Stay in the kitchen. You see that? Yeah. When we allow fear to hold us back and we are here in the United States, when we allow that, just the fact that there's racism out there or discrimination to hold us back from just giving it the best effort that we have in us, not what the world is, but us. Mm. the best effort to wake up and be your best self if you don't do that it's like moving into a mansion and just staying in the kitchen and not using the rest of the place mm. that's what i look that's how i look at the united states as and i came to a point where i realized i was living not in the kitchen i was living under the sink of the kitchen basically mm. because my mentality was being under the sink of the kitchen and i said to myself I gotta use the rest of this mansion. It is my fault. I can say nobody if I don't re use the rest of the mansion. Mm. And that was a shift in me that to just become the best self that I could be because there is racism, there is discrimination. I experienced it all. I got beat up by the cops. You, I mean, I have all the stories, but I cannot keep blaming that as the reason why I won't go out there and give you the best shot I have. Yes. You need to let go of that because once again, you become the lens that you see the world through. And if all you see is the hate in the world, you're going to become hateful and you're going to create hate in your own life. You got to let that go. Do I? Does that mean that we ignore it? No, we don't ignore it. But I just don't make it a primordial way that I see everything through. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? That makes so, so much sense. Oh, that makes so much sense. And, and, and it, it actually causes me to think, and I hope it's causing, as you called it, the Nikki Johnson Nation, to think, are we utilizing all of the abundant resources that exist here in the United States? There are so many of them, so many free ones and so many undiscovered ones and so many hidden ones and so many... Yeah, just that has really caused me just to take a moment and just kind of think. And maybe I have not taken full advantage of even the opportunity of having been born here in the United States. So that's deep. <laughs> and that's the only reason why I share my sister, because um I seen I seen how we live here. How I seen how people of color, how we live here. And yes, a lot of that is intentional neglect by those who are in control of the resources, right? Mm -hmm. I get it. Mm -hmm. But we can use that as a crutch. Yes. 
We can. We shouldn't. I don't think we should. And if you don't believe in that, then take a look at somebody like me who came from from literally hell. And I could have really just destroyed my own life. And I was destroying it. But I made different choices. And making different choices created a different life quality uh, for me. And in turn, I was able to help others around that look like me in our own communities to realize that too. So it's not just your dreams that are on the line. Yes. It's our community. So when you talk about helping our communities, one of the best ways we can do it is by becoming an example of success so that those children, those little girls and boys and other people can see you and say, if he did it, maybe I can too. Just like when Barack won the presidency, right? Yes. I was so happy. Why? Just because he was one of us that yes. made it there. It's yes. like the White House has a black man in it. Oh, <laughs> no, we're going to an end, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> but that gives such sense of belief in what we can achieve, even if it only happens once in every 300 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the point is to set the example and show that there is a possibility by you becoming that. Yeah. And that's a responsibility that all of us, I think, have on our shoulders. But realizing that, realizing that that responsibility is on each other's shoulder mm -hmm. is the beginning for the change. Oh, I love all of that. That is so good. So you've mentioned a little bit um, some of the things that you did. I know you were coping. I know you were just dealing with probably a lot of maybe even PTSD or just things that memories that popped up. You did some drinking, you came over, you made some decisions that may not have been great, but there was a moment that you decided I'm changing my life. I do know that you, you told us that you went to UCLA. I did talk about that at the top of the show, but you are also now a public speaker. Take us from that journey to where you're like my life, is worth more than this. There is a leader inside of me and you discovered that and you brought him out. Tell us about that process. You know, I was had, I think I mentioned this. I had this little itch inside of me, this little, um, this little voice, this just little voice that would say, you're supposed to be more. Mm. You ever feel that way? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're supposed to do more. You're supposed to be more. And this is back there, but it's a little voice, right? It's like a murmur. Mm -hmm. But, the lens and the chaos and the, the, lim the limiting beliefs we have and the negativities of the experiences that we're living in completely overshadows that voice. Yeah. And when I was at UCLA, which, like you said, it was one of the first times when um, I realized that I was supposed to be more. Mm. They were going to cut the student ser the tutoring services for people of color at UCLA. Now, you know, UCLA, if you, anybody knows, it's a, one of the biggest universities. And I got in there because of affirmative action, not because I was dumb, but because affirmative action forced them to take me. You see yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Because obviously I had the abilities. I just, when I took the SAT, I hardly spoke English. Mm. How the heck do you expect me to do well on the SAT then? I mean, oh, right. right. And they were asking me games that you guys play here. You were not it's asking not me to play in Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. If you asked me about the war, I would have scored hundred <laughs> percent. Right. <laughs> They were asking me about games that I was like, I don't, I don't know how to play that game. What does that mean? So I did atrocious on the on the SAT. So if we were based on those tests, if we were not for affirmative action, I would not get in there. Right. But obviously I graduated. So that shows that I would belong in there. Mm -hmm. But they were going to cut the tutoring services and they were going to close down the Chicano library and the African-American library, which were like as big as this room in a basement of one of the buildings. You know, UCLA has such big libraries, you can get lost in them, like the URL library, right? They're mm -hmm. huge, multiple floors. Mm -hmm. And these two little rooms that were allocated to the African American and the Chicano library were too expensive to keep. Ooh. Then the tutoring services that I was using because learning the average English is one thing, but having to learn the academic English, that's another level. Yes. And I was having a hard time understanding gender and sexism, you know, mm -hmm. I, I had just understood sex. Now I have to understand sexism. Right. <laughs> like that's a stretch. <laughs> right. And so when they were going to cut those programs, I used to work part time in the parking lot, in the, in the mm -hmm. parking. And I knew how much money UCLA makes just in parking alone. And I felt how unfair it was that they were going to cut this. And I felt that I needed to do something about it. And so I got five students together, my friends and I, we got together and we created that organization, CSC. Mm -hmm. Long story short, 
if you look, if you Google this, you see that it erupted in a hunger strike and we stopped all the cuts and we created the Chicano Studies Department. Mm. When that occurred, it was one of the first times that I said, wow, man. And I don't want to take credit for all of it because it wasn't just me, but I was the one that sat down in that, in that stair and I said, I got to do something about this. And that's what I call the power of one. You, if you really have, sometimes we have these desires to do things when we see the struggles in our communities and we hear it and then we just let it go because we go, oh, that's too much. I don't know how to do that. But you got to, that, that desire is like that engine light that turns on, on your car and says, hey, pay attention. <laughs> yeah. And your purpose telling you, come here. We're supposed to work together on this. So don't disregard that. And so that was one of the first times when I realized that I was supposed to be more and I was supposed to do more. I got kicked out of UCLA for a year, though. Why? Because that, when I got kicked out, they mentioned that, all right? You were one of the CSC members. I was like, oh, I, I was expecting you to say that. Maker, right. Right. But that wasn't the only reason why they kicked me out, and I cannot blame them. I was the one that was also, like I said, I was at war. And there were so many people in UCLA that were racist, racist, and if you talk to me and you were racist, there was nothing for me to talk to you about. I just kicked your butt because that's what you deserve in my mind. <laughs> and so I did a lot of that with, especially the fraternities that were really like out of line with things. And that got me kicked out of UCLA. Mm -hmm. And so when I got kicked out, I remember working that year and I was, you know, like the first four or five months, I was just partying, living it up. And then all of a sudden, boom, it hit me, my grandmother. Go to the United States. If you can make some dollars, you can send them back to us. Mm. And I found myself sitting in that warehouse I was working. I thought, wait a minute. I forgot what I'm here for. This, I'm screwing up. This is not what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. So I started working on all the things I needed to do to get back into school. Mm. And I completed all the requirements. And then I went through the interview and they allowed me back in. And then I graduated, right? So there's been these moments where I have had a glimpse of what I could do, the potential that I had, and then moments of failure. Because mm. getting kicked out of UCLA was a failure, right? It was my failure. I cannot blame them. I created that. I screwed up. And those moments of failure, though, are the moments created for us to pay attention and become better if yes. we are open, right? If we're open to the lesson. Yes. And, now, and you know what? I got to say, Nikki, I'm a hard head. I'm a hard head. <laughs> It takes me to like hit bottom and I go, okay. What a late than never, right? And so that was one of those major times when I said, okay, I gotta really stop fighting. I can't be attacking everybody. Right. Ooh, that these racist guys are wrong. Yeah. But I gotta stop doing that because I mean, the pleasure that I get from beating them up is not as good as me destroying my life. Mm -hmm. like, I'm the one that's destroying my life. Yeah. And so you have to make those choices to feed your ego or improve yourself. Yes. And I chose to improve myself and it was still a process, but that was one of the times where I decided that I was gonna start changing and making sure that I was more cognizant mm. of what I was doing. But I was not understanding that what I was doing was a product of the lens I was using and the thinking I was having. I still didn't put those two things together. I wanted to change my behavior without understanding that the recording in my mind was the one generating the behavior. Ooh. And it took me a few years still after that mm -hmm. to understand that. And you talked about, about PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Yeah, I never went to the doctors in order to deal with all that trauma, never did. And so it was manifesting in fighting. Mm -hmm. and the, the worst thing is that I was good at it. <laughs> I was great at fighting. Mm -hmm. I love boxing. So I even ended up boxing for a few years. Mm -hmm. I enjoy the science of boxing, right? And and so because I became good at that and I had a sense of power when I won every fight, yeah. it became an addiction. Mm -hmm. That sense of power. And so I understand when in our communities we do things that make us feel powerful because when you look at the rest of the world, you feel powerless. Yes. I had to shift that. You see that? That's what I'm saying. Once again, that's the lens. Is it true that there are situations where we are made powerless? It's true, but there are situations like Nikki Johnson where you can feel powerful and you got to look for those examples and figure it out which one 
you can implement in your own life and how you can become powerful in a more positive way. Yes. So it was just a redirecting of the vision and a redirecting of my energies. Yes. That created that. Mm. Does that make sense? That's good. That's good. When you were talking, all I heard was the war was over. You just had to get there here. The war was over. I love that. So we're talking about the leader with Danny. You've told us examples of when you were allowing your leader to come out. What would be three things that you could say to someone who is going through that same inner war and they hear that nagging voice that you were referring to and they've lived in hell in their own war zone, something horrific, and there's that war still going on, but yet they keep hearing that leader speaking to them. What would be three things that you could say that would help them recognize that that's what that voice is, that would help them acknowledge the voice and connect with it, and that would help them step outside of what they're used to going to going through and walking into something that's new for them? Great question, Nikki. Number one, decide that the world and the ex negative experiences of the world will not decide who you become. Oh, that is, that is the major one for me. That's good. See, I couldn't allow the war to decide who I was going to be for the rest of my life. Mm. And every time we experience something negative and drastic, the mistake that I kept making was to allow that experience to decide who I was going to become. You mm. see what I mean? And that's the hay the hay produces. Like that movie, right? There's a movie mm -hmm. called that. But when that movie came out, I was thinking, that's exactly what happened. The hate that hate produces. Yeah. So whatever it is that you're experiencing, I want to encourage you, separate the experience from your intrinsic value. Those two things don't go together. But you oh, have to make it. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. Yeah? We cannot go past that. Separate the experience from your value. That is so good. Right. I have goosebumps everywhere. That just broke in someone's heart. When they hear this, that's going to be the key that they needed to hear. Please keep going. But, oh, that was good. Oh. Well, I'm, I'm glad that he, that is valuable because it's the truth, actually. Because, yes, you so much, so many times we experience these negative things in the world and we allow that to become the platform upon which we say, am I good enough or not? Yes. When that has nothing to do with you inside of you it really it, it shouldn't i know that it feels like it so build a barrier between the experience and your platform how you decide how valuable you are that's number one once you do that number two start paying attention to that inner voice i remember when i started paying attention to that inner voice after i read think and grow rich by napoleon hill that book saved my life mm. you should get it. Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. The chapter on auto-suggestion. I have it. <laughs> that book, for the first time, I thought, wow. So this guy is saying that I can actually rewire my mind, what he thinks. Mm -hmm. And I found it to be absurd at that moment. Because when we are in our mind, it's our world. And we cannot fathom the fact that this world can be different. But every mind is a world. That's the truth. And so I remember me the first day I started, I said, you know what, let me pay attention to that voice because that voice is always there and we don't pay attention to it because we just think it's us and it is. So I started paying attention, Nikki, and I said to myself, I'm going to write down, I'm going to keep track how many times I have a negative thought, whether it's a violent thought, which was a lot of those, a violent <laughs> thought, a jealous thought, an anger thought, right? I'm just going to keep track. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the number exactly, but I tracked that for 24 hours. And this is one of the first things I asked my people to do when I coached them. I was well over 100, you know that? In 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Well over 100. I remember that. And when I did that, I remember me thinking, gosh, I'm really in a lot of negative moments. Like my mind, my whole thing is like a negative life. Mm -hmm. And then it makes sense to me. If I'm thinking negatively all the time, then no wonder that there's always negative things happening to me or with me. Yes. And so become self-aware, number number two, right? Start paying attention to that inner voice that you have back there. And if you do not agree with what it says, then 
start making a decision to rewire what a voice says. And that's what affirmations are for. Mm -hmm. Look, let me show you something. You see this? Yes. Look. Mm -hmm. I Look. am relentless. I am powerful. I am healthy. Yes. I am outgoing. I am, I am at peace. I am creative. Yes. Yes. Look at the last one, Nikki. I, I am inspirational. Am I've been saying this for 20 years, I guess now, or 15, 20 years. And so I've been able to rewire that guy that I'm describing to you into these things here. And it's amazing to me when people say to me, Paolo, you're so inspirational. You're so motiva motivational. I always go, oh my God, there, I've been writing that. Like, <laughs> like it never leaves me going, oh my God, I've been saying that it's right here. Yeah. And I've been saying it. I've been visualizing it. And somebody is saying it now. It's amazing how that happens. Yes. My affirmations back then, I used to go party, right, on Friday nights. Mm -hmm. And I really just wanted to go out and have fun. And mm -hmm. I know people are going to resonate with this, especially men. All you want is go out and have fun with your friends, right? But right before I would leave the bathroom, I'm, you know, combing my hair, getting my little, my curls ready, you know, putting a little cologne. <laughs> I, miss a, I miss a lady that, you know, she doesn't think I stink. But right before I leave the restroom, Nikki, I would look in the mirror and say this. I wonder who I'm going to F up today. That's right. exactly what I used to say. Mm -hmm. And then I wonder why I ended up in fights all the time. See, that was my affirmation. Yep. Because that was my affirmation. I walked into anywhere I went in just like this, like. Just looking around, you know, with mm -hmm. this frown, with this energy. Mm -hmm. What happened? The other men who were in the same energy flow, guess what? They will feel my presence. I will feel theirs. We look each other for two seconds. Over. <laughs> yeah. And you become what you think about. You become the lens that you see the world through. And that energy, that energy, that man, I know you know what I'm talking about. That energy is for everything. All the thoughts that you have. Mm -hmm. So when we're not making as much money, it's because we're thinking thoughts that are not equivalent to a lot of money. Mm -hmm. When we are not happy, it's because we're having thoughts that are constantly about unhappiness. And so it, that's where it works, right? So number two, rewire that voice in your mind. Start saying to yourself, spend 20 minutes a day saying to yourself who you intend to become, what you intend to create in your life. Start saying it because when you say these words, the amazing thing is what I call the biology of success. See, God created us with everything that we need inside of us, mm -hmm. the systems. And I know when people used to say that you have everything you need, I used to get so angry. I'd be like, what the heck are you talking about? Right. <laughs> but a better way to say that is that God created us with all the biology systems for us to drive your mind to create what we desire. Yeah. That's more accurate. And so if you start saying to yourself, I am confident, I am peaceful. I am a great this. I am a great that. Yes. Every time you say that word, your brain connects these neuropathic pathways in your brain and it yes. starts becoming normal for it. And yes. you start living that way. Can I add something to that real quick? Yes. For people who, and, and I, I've probably done two interviews in the last two days. We've had the same conversation on the interview. For the people who think affirmations are crazy, they don't work. If you are a Christian, I have a scripture for you. Even the Bible tells you to speak those things that are not as though they were. That is what an affirmation is. That's that right. is what affirmation is. Go ahead, Pablo. Yeah. And today, you know, that post that I put on Instagram about the Bible, this is what I said. Napoleon Hill says, uh, for a man, uh, you become what you think about. But where he got it from was from the Bible. Come because on. the Bible says, for a man thinketh, so is he. Come on now. <laughs> so Napoleon Hill got the idea from the Bible, and then he blew up, right? He's the godfather of personal development. And yet people say, I believe Napoleon Hill, but I don't believe in the Bible. Right. That's where he got it from. How right. can you say that you believe Napoleon, but not the Bible, right? Now, that's another conversation. <laughs> so start saying that which you intend to become, and I guarantee you, if you do it long enough. But there's a, re there's a way that you're supposed to do affirmations, and that's why... I coach people how to do them properly. Mm -hmm. so there's a process, but start saying that. And number three, the third thing I'll say, once you can become self-aware, then have clear intention. Mm -hmm. Have a clear why. Mm -hmm. If you become very clear on that why with self-awareness, 
it'll be a constant course correction that you must continue to do but you will continue to improve day after day after day after day and that's what leadership development is that decision for you to become more relevant in the world around you that's what leadership is and those are the three things that i would suggest oh i love it i wish we could take a stay last just take a long pause and just chew on all of that goodness oh but you can rewind it if you're listening to this rewind it and take notes okay so let's talk about your academy your leadership let's talk about uh the genesis leadership program that you have why did you start it when did you start it and give us a little bit more information about it so i've been a community organizer and union representative for years so i organize workers at the county level the state level hospitals and like i said i've seen our communities very neglected and i've always believed that we got to get together to protect our family mm -hmm. and obviously you know now where i get it from right mm -hmm. as i gone through that recruiting people and developing their leadership i've learned different techniques and put things to work and i created new ways for myself to improve their leadership and eventually i realized that this was something that our communities needed everywhere mm. because if our communities had leadership development as part of the school systems i guarantee you so many other kids wouldn't end up in jail yes because everything we spoke about if somebody would have told me these things when i was 20 i probably would have saved a lot of the pain and agony and tribulations that i went through right and thank god like i said i stayed alive even through those so i decided that i want in in um let me see what was it somewhere in the 2000s i went to a training where it was made clear to me that i had a purpose and this is like the last one going back to that question nick if you allow me to put it in there real quick there was this training that i went to where i fell miserably in the exercise okay there was about 60 people there i knew two of them so 60 57 of them didn't know me at all <laughs> and through the exercise I'm supposed to admit to them that I couldn't care about them so I didn't remember their names. Ooh. I said that 57 times. That's the first time that I interacted with these people. Yeah. But yet out of that they picked me as one of the three people that they would send a message to their families in this exercise where we were all dying on a ship and you had to pick three people that you could trust that would take the message to your family. Mm. They picked me out of those people and I was one of the three. And I remember when I got chosen through the whole exercise, right? I don't want to explain the whole thing. I felt that way of the responsibility. And I thought to myself, how can these people choose me after I, what I just did to them? And I realized that the world expects of me. And that day is when that was the final straw that broke the, what is it? That animal, the, the camel. The that broke the camel. <laughs> that animal. <laughs> Some animal got broken right with a straw. <laughs> um, that's the day that, I, that was the final blow for me to realize, wow, I have a purpose. I have a mission in this world. I don't know why even today, to be honest with you, all I know is that the world expects of me. And that responsibility that I feel to that is what pushes me to continue to be better, mm -hmm. to, to do all these things that are about leadership development. And so I developed my company, Genesis Leadership, to help everybody and anybody who is interested in becoming better because this is not a service that you see in our communities at all hmm. nowhere to be found right and if we can help people develop their leadership we can help our communities be in a better place and so that's why i developed it and it's performance right it's all these things about becoming self-aware right. how to really leave fear behind or how to redefine fear because fear doesn't leave that's not true that we're fearless i mean i know what people mean but fear doesn't go away i feel it all the time it's just that you have certain belief system and a certain recording you can create that allows you to just keep walking through it. Mm -hmm. And as you walk through that fear, this is the other thing. On the other side of that fear is not just the goal of what you achieve. You know what's more important? The confidence. Because we all want confidence, but we don't want to deal with the fear. Mm -hmm. We all want confidence, but we don't want to deal with the challenges. But guess what? That is how life gives you confidence. They put these challenges in front of you so that you are pushed through it. And in the process, you build confidence, right? It's like Tupac said, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Right. One of those. <laughs> you want confidence? You got to deal with the fears and the challenges. Get excited when you see that because that's where confidence gets built. And so um, 
I'm developing an app because I, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way of getting out there, really. And in, nowadays, as you know, the cell phone is something that people take everywhere. Right. What if there could be an app where I can help people build their confidence? So I'm developing an app right now, and it's, we're, I'm going through the process. Mm-hmm. It's going to be called Confidence Builder by mm-hmm. Genesis. And it'll help people who want to break the fear of speaking in public. Yes. The fear of just going through their dreams. Mm-hmm. And leadership development, right? The difference between my app and the usual coaching programs, coaching can be expensive, okay? Let's be honest. Because it is. Mm-hmm. But what if what if there was a membership in the app that is cheaper, that mm-hmm. you could be a member monthly, and every month or every week you can receive a message to help you keep developing, right? Yeah. Maybe, like, I don't know, $65 a month or something like that instead of three dollars $400 a month. Right. I think a lot more people will be able to act. It will be more accessible. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm going to work on to try to put it out to the masses. Oh, I love it. And I pray all the resources, the connections, tech savvy people or whatever it is that you need comes to you. That is an amazing idea. And I love the fact that you're trying to help people build confidence on the go, get assistance on the go, get motivation on the go. I love that. I'm excited about your app. <laughs> I'm excited. I, I, today I woke up at 3.30, 3.30 in the morning. You hear me? Because I couldn't sleep anymore. I was like, I'm wasting time sleeping. And when you're excited about your dreams and your goals, you go to sleep at 12 midnight. You woke up at 12 1. You wake up at 12 1 and you say, I overslept. Uh (laughs) That is me going to bed in the morning, waking up in the morning. I love that. Let's switch gears for just a little bit. I want to ask you some questions. Tell me the first thing that comes to mind. We're going to start with these words. Joy. Happy. Mm. Challenge. Growth. Mm. God. Awe. Ooh, good. If you could have dinner with three people, dead or alive, who would they be and why? Oh, wow. Okay. Three people, dead or alive. Wow, Nikki, you're hitting me here, Nikki. All right, I got to think about this one more. Okay. There or alive, who would they be? Mm-hmm. I would like to meet with Sandino. Sandino was the, the father of the Nicaraguan Revolution many years Ooh. ago. Sandino is his name. Uh, the second person, Malcolm X. I would really like to sit down and talk to Malcolm X. You know that? Mm-hmm. I was, when I read his book, that was another big book that I read. Mm-hmm. And the third person, who would that be? Hmm. Mother Teresa. Ooh. Yeah. You know what? You picked someone that started a war, someone that was a fighter, but then tried to bring peace and then the mother of peace and charity. I know that's weird, huh? It's, it's, I, it's, but they're all you, but you don't get you don't catch that. They are all parts of you. It's like the evolution of it, you know that. Yeah, yes. well, that's interesting, Nikki. Yes. That's you a just good thing. Yourself and all three people. Yeah, you're right. I think that's the trajectory that I've gone through myself, and I just want to hear their input. Mm-hmm. How they work through that, also. Mm. That's why I picked those because. The other day they were talking about leadership in Clubhouse mm-hmm. and people always have this tendency of speaking of leadership as, you know, people like you and I who are speaking to the masses and things like that. Mm-hmm. When leadership is not just that, right. a single mother raising her own child, that's leadership. Yes. Right. And so they were talking about handshake. It has to be a firm handshake for a leader. And I was thinking, well, I said it in the meeting, I said, Mother Teresa didn't have a strong handshake. I doubt right. that she even cared to shake hands. Right. Well, she was a leader, a quiet leader, right? Yeah. And she led by example. So it's not about speaking because she wasn't a big speaker either like that. It was just actions and examples. And yeah. so there's so many forms of leadership. I just want to make sure that we're cognizant that women are leaders, top leaders creating life and mm-hmm. nurturing life. Mm-hmm. And so we just have to expand. And that's what I want to help people understand. Because so many of us say, I'm not a leader. I'm not a leader. You have leadership qualities. You just don't realize that. We just have to help you harness them and bring them out. That's yeah. all. Because I love the way I was saying in your bio that sometimes we are taught or led to believe that leaders are the politicians. 
they are the business owners or the people with the huge followings on social media. But as you were talking, I was thinking people know me for my motivational speaking, coaching or the podcast. But I'm also a leader when I am volunteering to give away food, when I'm making sure people can keep their lights on. Um, I don't have a firm handshake, but I have a warm smile and a big hug. Like we all have these leadership qualities. And I love that you want to develop them. Some leadership academies want to develop other coaches, other speakers. You want to develop the person. And from there, I know you're going to teach them how to blossom into whatever that leader position is. But I love the fact that you just want to bring out the leader in that person. You yeah. just want to connect them with that and then teach them how to soar from there. I love it. And one day in the future, Nikki, I'm saying it here in your program, one day in the future, when I become a multimillionaire with everything that I need to, that I intend to create in the world, yeah. you see Genesis Leadership Center developments everywhere throughout our neighborhoods. People are going to say, go to the Genesis Leadership Center. They can help you there. And it's oh, going to become a yeah. place where we can come and grow and help each other and help the community. And you don't have man. to say and, and you know what? I'm going to take it even further. This might even be a part of your dream, but I hope it is. That you can put those programs into the schools as well. Because some of our children, they're graduating knowing how to pass those tests. But the stuff that they need to survive in this world and really thrive, not just how to make money but how to really survive and be yeah. people. They need your academy. They need your, your program. They really do. Definitely. That's a great idea. I never thought of that, but yeah, why not? And if we got, and this is the thing, money doesn't buy you happiness, but money can help us get rid of a lot of the things that make us unhappy. <laughs> you better say and that. so I understand. So we need money. If we want to, you know, uh, re-envision the school system, mm -hmm. it's going to take money. We got to make money to make sure that that occurs. Mm, I love it. I have two more questions for you. If you could take the greatest lesson that you've learned in your entire life and go tell it to your nine-year-old self, what would that lesson be? Ooh, you are something else, Nikki Johnson. <laughs> I would say to myself, the greatest adversary that you will face in the years to come going to be you mm. that's it yeah because yeah like i said the world has all the challenges and bad things in it but you can use that as the reason why you won't be a better you you have to make a choice and then you choose and it's in that process of making that choice or not making it that we that we lose or win mm. and so it's just up to you and when I look at my life, the problems that were being generated was because of the choices I was making. And so that was the greatest fight that I had to win, the fight against me. It wasn't everybody else. It was really just me. That's oof. Pablo, if you had 24 hours to live, what would you spend it doing? I would spend it with my wife on the beach, mm. giving her hugs and kisses. Mm. <laughs> That's what I would do and bring my family from Nicaragua and spend it with me for that, those 24 hours. That would be it. That would be good for me. Mm. Oh, I love it. Love it. You are so amazing. All right. Tell everyone how they can get in contact. I uh, have a Facebook page, Genesis Leadership, right? With a Y, Y E N E S I S I S. I have an Instagram, Genesis also, Genesis Leadership. And if you're on Clubhouse, I have a club under Union Leadership Builders. And I open rooms from, you know, Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays at 12 noon, and Saturdays from 7 to 10 a.m. Pacific time, California time. And coming up in July, I think around July 13th or so, we're going to be launching the, the Confidence Builder by Genesis app. And I will, take, I will take between 10 and 15 people to be the first ones to go through the, through the first program that I'll put on that app which is going to be tailored to help people overcome the fear of public speaking. Mm. I mean, you know, that fear of fix you, you heard it, Nikki, right? In Clubhouse, I mean, I didn't realize how much out there people need that. They really fear for speaking, and it affects your wages. It affects your probabilities of promotion. Mm -hmm. I mean, it affects so much of your life and your potential, even dating, because you're scared to talk to a, a lady and say, hey, I want to take you out. Right. All that stuff, right? And so... um. 
I'm going to go through that program. It's going to be a six week program, but I guarantee you I'm putting the program together, knowing the challenges I've had when I was just trying to make those transitions. Mm. It's going to be a formula that people can follow all the way through at the end of the six weeks, they'll know what they need to do. And there will be an internal shift that it occur mm. because of the exercises that I'm going to have in place during those six weeks. And obviously, you're not going to be the best speaker right there and then, but you'll have a blueprint to continue working on it, and you will only get better after that. So if you're interested on those, I'll have my post on the Instagram when I open up the launch, actually. And I'm only going to take 10 to 15 people because I don't want too many at first. Yeah. Uh, if you're interested in that, just look out for that. And if it helps you, then you'll be one of those. Yes. So normally, my last question is what makes you an overcomer. I'm not going to do that with you today. You are a powerful speaker. I got to experience it. Today, they got to experience a little taste of it. So what I want to do is allow you the last few minutes to speak to the audience. I'm going to go off camera, give it to you. I love you all. Thank you all so much for watching. Remember, you are overcomers. Obstacles are not barriers. If you kick them down, they become stepping stones. I will talk to you next week because Pablo is going to take us out. So Pablo, the floor is absolutely yours. Speak to your audience. Thank you, Nikki, for having me here today. I appreciate you. And I appreciate the Nikki Johnson Nation for listening today. Fear is a big thing in our lives. It comes in many different forms. I encourage you, when you face fear next time, just know that that is what is being given to you in your life to become a better you. You see, without fear and without challenges in our lives, there is no push for us to become a better us. Imagine if you just have nothing going on in your life and everything is just nearly willy. Fear itself is just a system to flag that you're supposed to pay more attention to something. That is the evolutionary purpose of fear. The mistake we make is that we allow these moments, these temporary moments and experiences of fear to decide who we become by the, the rest of our lives. So separate the experience, like I said, from the character and the values that you, that you build within. Remember, this is my definition of fear, and I'll share it here in Nikki Johnson's Nation podcast. F-E-A-R, future expectations are relinquished. That's what fear is. I don't like the definition of false evidence appears real, even though I understand what it means, because when you feel fear, it feels real to you, right? But in essence, what we do when we give in to fear, we are giving up our right to intent. We're giving up our right to choose. We are giving up the right to expect for ourselves and of ourselves. That's what fear is. It's a silent contract that you sign to throw your hands in the air and just don't expect anything for you or, or by you. So next time when you feel fear, acknowledge it. It's normal to feel fear. And then after that, I want you to repeat this in your mind. The new definition, what fear should stand for. Future expectations are re-envisioned. F-E-A-R. Future expectations are re-envisioned. When you feel fear, the minute you feel it, I want you to start saying your, in your mind, future expectations are re-envisioned. Future expectations are re-envisioned. Future expectations are re-envisioned. Future expectations are re-envisioned. Say that. Keep saying it. And you will find that strength inside to say, okay, I'm just going to reassess what I expect out of this situation. And once you identify that, push through. Do it. Rewire your mind to know that the fear that you are feeling is just a warning to reassess what you expect, just to pay more attention. And if you can rewire your mind to think that way, you will have the physiological response for your body to have the confidence to push through it. On the other side of fear is confidence. That's the only way you gain it, okay? By going through it, and that's the purpose of fear. I appreciate you all, and keep working on yourself. I hope that what I said today made sense and it resonated with you. And as I always say, see you at the top where the champions belong. Thank you so much for joining me today. If this was your first time tuning in, welcome to the Overcomers family. I cannot adequately express my gratitude to all of you for tuning in today. 
If today's show helped or impacted you in any way, it would help me tremendously if you would review and rate today's episode. And please be sure to leave me a comment on whatever platform you are listening to this podcast. Also, be sure to connect with me over on Facebook and Instagram at The Obstacle Overcomer Podcast. And if you go ahead and hit that subscribe button, you will be notified every time there's a new episode available. And don't forget that sharing is caring. So please go ahead and tell a friend and share this with your loved one because this will help me to reach those who really need a word to empower their lives. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. And don't forget that obstacles are not barriers. They are stepping stones. Talk to you next week. Thank you.